Now, let me update you on the coronavirus. The U.S. remains the epicenter of the pandemic. It now has close to 3 million confirmed cases and more than 52,000 new infections were reported just on Sunday. Florida is one area of concern. The infection rate is escalating. And total infections are now past 200,000. 11,000 of them were reported on Sunday. Bear in mind there were July the 4th celebrations at the weekend, but this beach in Miami, which would normally be packed, was shut. A citywide curfew was also in place. And this is one of the reasons Florida is taking uh, the threat so seriously. Another stark statistic is that its infections rose by 168% in June. Its daily infection rate is above any recorded by a European country at the height of the pandemic. So Florida is right in the middle of this. So is Texas. Cases there have now passed 200,000 and more than 8,000 people were hospitalized on Sunday. According to local media, hospitals may reach capacity within two weeks. And there's an ongoing political debate about whether the state needs a stay at home order. Next, further west onto Arizona, infections there are rising rapidly. They've almost reached 100,000. Gyms, bars and cinemas have all been closed until the end of the month. And more than 5,000 people were admitted to hospital on Sunday. There are also concerns in Arizona. Hospitals may reach their limits. Here's one emergency doctor. It's absolutely terrifying. Um, we're having whole families who end up in the hospital. We had one family with three members who were actually on ventilators in the ICU. And you see how it's devastating for the families, the community, and for those of us who are healthcare workers holding their hands in their, in their moments of need. It's, it's nothing short of devastating. It, it's challenging because our workspaces in the hospitals are totally full, our entire staff and it takes an entire staff of uh, our team, uh, respiratory therapists and nurses, and even down to our environmental services and admin support to really be able to take care of patients the way we, we typically can. And we're just not able to, both because the degree of sickness that the patients have, how much time it takes um, for each patient donning and doffing over and over again, and our exhausted workforce. We've been on um, deployment, essentially, if you will, since March. And it's simply exhausting. People are ending up with, with acute stress. Well, from the US to Latin America, we'll have updates from Brazil and El Salvador. But first of all, Bolivia, compared to some of its neighbours, it had been faring well. But unfortunately, the numbers are now starting to move. Infections have passed 39,000. There have been over 1,300 deaths. Also, the health ministers tested positive. The mining minister and minister of the presidency have too. Now, these escalating numbers are a particular concern because Bolivia is one of the poorest countries in Latin America. Its health system is ill-equipped to cope with the pandemic. I wanted to highlight the city of Cochabamba. It's been badly hit. Crematoriums are overwhelmed. These are workers digging makeshift graves. And this upsetting footage illustrates the pressure on Bolivia's resources. This coffin holds the body of a 62-year-old who died from COVID-19. It was left on the street for hours because cemeteries had had to close their doors. Well, next we turn to El Salvador. The chief of the cabinet is on the left here, Mario Duran. In the past 24 hours, he's tested positive for the virus. The government has imposed some of the toughest measures in Latin America, and that's been effective, keeping cases below 8,000. A further reopening of the economy, though, has been delayed by two weeks. As I'm sure you know, Brazil is the epicenter of the pandemic in Latin America. It has over 1.6 million cases and over 64,000 deaths. Some experts actually think Brazil is on track to become the country with the highest death toll by late July. And this New York Times graphic shows that Sao Paulo is the worst affected state. It alone has more than 320,000 infections. But even as the crisis worsens, the city of Sao Paulo is very much getting back to business. In the last few hours, hair salons, bars and restaurants have all reopened. So given these numbers, What's the case for that kind of reopening? Here's the BBC's correspondent in Sao Paulo, Katie Watson. Well, simply that they think that they can cope. I mean, I mean, if you take take the example of Sao Paulo, it's one of the wealthiest states. It's the wealthiest state, sorry, in Brazil. Um, in terms, they've looked at issues such as uh, occupation of intensive care beds, 
uh, the death toll. And they've, they've labelled every, uh, the, the, across the state, they've labelled municipalities um, in a series of five phases. So if you hit a certain phase and you can reopen, if, you, if, if the situation gets worse and they have to go back to closing. So here in Sao Paulo City, um, they have been able to reopen. In fact, I've just taken a walk around the block and for the last three months, uh, you know, there've been restaurants and beauty salons absolutely closed. It's been dead. But, um, you know, just walking around in a space of, you know, a couple of blocks, there are several restaurants all getting ready, um, reopening, and it feels much more alive. But of course, uh, many experts are saying this is coming at, at completely the wrong time. And those businesses which are opening, presumably they're having to follow a range of rules. Absolutely. So one I walked by, you could see there were yellow arrows that had been uh, painted on the floor to show which way you needed to walk to, uh, to collect your food in a restaurant. I uh, saw so another uh, several restaurants with hand sanitizer um, waiting there. So people obviously have to use that when they come in the restaurants and distant and distance tables as well. So those are the, 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 the measures that they're, they're putting in. Um, but of course, it, a few days ago, Rio reopened its bars and restaurants and there were uh, images and videos coming out showing people absolutely packed into these bars, not wearing masks, as is mandatory across much of Brazil. Mm. Um, so the, that's the concern that people are now, you know, desperate to get back um, to some kind of normality. Yet we're still very far from that sense of that, that normal you know, normality here in Brazil with the death toll still rising. Now, let's continue to bring you coronavirus updates from around the world. Next, we turn to India. It now has close to 700,000 confirmed cases. That's the third highest total after America and Brazil. It's recorded more than 24,000 new infections just in the last 24 hours, and its death toll is over 19,000. Here's Yagita Lamai in Mumbai. Indian authorities have been repeatedly pointing out that even though the number of cases on the whole are rising, the mortality rate in India seems to be lower than other countries with a comparable number of cases. But over the past many weeks, we've spoken to frontline doctors who say that COVID deaths are not being properly counted. Sometimes, uh, you know, the comorbidity that a person might have is listed on the death certificate rather than COVID-19. Uh, in some places, they've told us that people who were brought in dead um, even if they have COVID-like symptoms, are not tested, and therefore they're not counted among COVID deaths. Uh, and finally, you know, of course, uh, even before coronavirus hit India, the system of recording deaths uh, sometimes, you know, is much delayed, and therefore there are worries that the number of deaths could actually be uh, far lower than the actual mortality that we've seen in India because of coronavirus. From India to Israel, it's imposed some restrictions after reimposed some restrictions after a spike in infections. Bars, gyms, and event halls have now been closed, and this is why. This shows the numbers of new cases in Israel since lockdown was eased just over a month ago, and you can see that marked here, and the number of cases steadily climbing since then. These are the latest pictures from the intensive care unit in the country's largest hospital, just close to Tel Aviv. Well, we're looking at the impact of COVID-19 in a range of countries around the world. Next to Australia and an extraordinary state of affairs, the border between Victoria and New South Wales is being closed for the first time since the Spanish flu pandemic, and that was over a century ago. That's because of what's happening in Victoria's capital, Melbourne. Australia's national numbers remain low, very low, frankly, compared with many other countries. 106 people have died. There have been around 8,500 cases. But on Monday, there were 127 new infections recorded in Victoria. That's the highest daily total since the pandemic began in Australia. Nine public housing estates in Melbourne now appear to be the focus. They're under a five-day lockdown after a cluster of cases was found. This means around 3,000 people being told to stay in their homes. And some of them are saying the government's been slow to provide essential supplies and information. Here's more on that from ABC's Elias Kluwer. The latest outbreaks have come from the council flats in the working class areas of Melbourne's inner northwest. Now, the government said as of Sunday that 30 cases had come from several households at these residences and effective immediately it shut down those nine apartment buildings encompassing 3,000 residents. Now, these residents had no notice that they would be locked inside their homes. They also had no notice that 500 police officers would be roaming the halls of these buildings. That's effectively one officer to every six residents. Now, 
I spoke to some people living in these buildings who say the food they've been provided by the government is insufficient, saying things like they've been given cereal with no milk, jam, uh, a tin of tuna just to feed uh, 10 people in a household. They say they're being treated like prisoners. They've also said that it's racist. If this was happening in a more affluent part of Melbourne, uh, police of this kind of magnitude would not be deployed. Now, the government and the Premier of Victoria, Daniel Andrews, has pledged to offer more support, but the people living here just want these draconian measures eased. The government says they'll be in place for five days as they attempt to get the virus under control. I also wanted to show you this sign in a window in one of the tower blocks. As you can see, it reads, treat us as humans, not caged animals. And here is one of the residents. I heard sirens outside and when I looked down, there was about 50 police cars just parked under our building, closing all the streets and every entrance and exit. When there's that much police presence, you begin to feel like you did something wrong. So it wasn't a safe feeling. There was no health representatives present at the time. People believe that these buildings are full of immigrants and uh, people that just lower class and they don't treat them as normal citizens. To Europe next, as you'll know, for a time it was the epicentre of the pandemic. Now it's slowly reopening. Here's just one example. The Louvre in Paris is back in business, albeit with limited visitor numbers, compulsory face masks, and you have to book online in advance. Nonetheless, it's a big moment, not just for the museum, but for Paris as a tourist destination. Here's Hugh Schofield. The tourists are still not back in France, so for now this is a treat mainly for Parisians. A Louvre with perhaps a fifth of its regular customers, making enjoyment of the treasures here not a scramble, but as it should be, a pleasure. So for the next couple of months at least, a chance to see the Mona Lisa like you've never seen her before in scenes of relative tranquility. If you've been here before in normal times, you'll know exactly what I mean. The health rules in place keep people moving mainly in the same direction, but because numbers are much lower than normal, there's no regimentation. It's perfectly possible to stop and enjoy. It's great. I've been enjoying a lot. It's a pleasure. How long will the new system last? No one knows. It depends on COVID and also on money. The Louvre's been losing millions. But if you're someone who's concerned about how crowds can ruin art, now's the time to go. Hugh Schofield, BBC News, Paris.